Hey everybody, it's so wonderful to see you today. Um, I'm very excited um, to introduce to you um, Evan Turner for the second half of our week on Indie Games. And so, you know, um, last Tuesday we had Peter Atkinson, who founded Wizards of the Coast way back when it was an indie company, come to speak to us. And um, today we are going to have Evan, um, who is one of the leading experts on indie RPGs uh, in the world, uh, speak about all the cool stuff that's been happening since Witch of the Coast became a company, basically, and all the cool opportunities that you all have to like make radical art and design really, really cool games. Um, I met Evan about 10 years ago, and we founded the journal Analog Game Studies together, and he is just one of the coolest people in the world. Um, he will DJ your party if you want him to. He will also run a game um, for you if you want him to. And uh, if you ever, ever, ever need to know um, who's written eloquently about something, Evan is there to tell you who's done it, how they've done it, and to offer some thoughts on the topic. So Evan, I'm just really glad that you're here today. And I'm excited for you to drop some knowledge on the room about indie games, so welcome. Thank you, Aaron, and I'm I'm really appreciative that that everybody was able to uh, to make it here. And um, I, I, again, I'd like to begin with with, with a land acknowledgement, which is just basically, you know, we're sitting on various lands right now, um, and its ownership, its use, you know, determines much of our lived reality. And I, I think now that we're, you know. Um, in the midst of a kind of world geopolitical crisis, we understand how much land and territory matter. So where I'm sitting actually is where the Shawnee among other tribes uh, use these territories as um, game hunting among other places until the Treaty of Camp Charlotte in 1774 with the British uh, severed all ancestral ties to this land and made it uh, available for exploitative settler industrial and agricultural development. But uh, our guilt doesn't help so much as our donations and our, you know, our support for uh, indigenous communities that are still fighting to this day for their own, um, uh, their own, you know, pieces of this world. And I just want to make sure that we all recognize that land is essential to the projects that we conduct. So. That was my first preface. Second preface is I just want to thank Aaron Tremel and also all this, the amazing people I've had the pleasure of working with and playing indie games with um, in the community for like the past two decades. And um, it's like uh, Aaron could have asked dozens of other people to give this talk, understanding indie games. Um, because you've already heard from two of our scenes rock stars, Alex Roberts and Jason Morningstar. And Peter Atkinson started off an indie company that then, um, you know, Mike Pondsmith uh, helped save from, from lawsuits in the early 90s. All right. And, but uh, I think Aaron asked me because uh, I'm a gossip and I know where all the bodies are buried. And, uh, and I also can say that. Um, I, I really do love and adore this community. I'm part of it. And, and I'm going to try and portray it actually with some love and authenticity as well, uh, in addition to, to processing our bitterness and trauma. And I, I really, you know, I, I want to say that's what community is. It's, it, it's high, high, uh, high times and low times experienced together. Um, so um, Indie role-playing games can really be defined across four main pillars. And, um, and one is, is just the game design itself. How is the game designed? And there is even an aesthetic that we can say, oh, this looks indie or this doesn't look indie. Um, but we can talk about uh, attributed to arts, books, or the rules themselves. Uh, but indie is also communities. And that means that, uh, you know, do you do you have the right status to be in the community you know have you published a game how have you published the game have you paid your authors a certain way have you hung out with the right people these are all various prerequisites for participating in what we call the indie community and if the, you think that sounds a little bit anxious it's a little anxiety inducing i'll tell you that much and it, it, it is it is just for 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 many many years you, you know you you don't ever know if you belong even though you're all supposed to um, the third pillar is the technologies of production and distribution, which uh, Aaron Tremell has written about, uh, you know, with respect to the digital nature of analog games, um, but, but also uh, just, you know, very blatantly um, 
uh, things change, how people uh, finance and write and put together and publish and, and distribute these games. And tracking those actually also helps us you know, pinpoint different trends in any community. It, it actually turns into a, a minefield uh, later on in, in indie game production uh, and to this day. And then finally, the fourth pillar is actually playing the damn games. Just, uh, just, just spelling that out there. We can talk about them all on the internet all we want, but uh, actual play, which again, is now been redefined as like live streaming of games, but we initially used it as, as a way of saying, well, your weird experimental game, have you actually tried it? Does it actually work? Does it actually deliver your idea? Um, that is the fourth pillar. So I, I mean, this whole talk is just basically me telling uh, the same tale three different times. Uh, it's the tale of indie, indie tabletop role-playing games. First, it'll be my perspective as I experienced it. Um, a second time with sort of a, a basic timeline of about 20 this specific games products that hit the market at different times, um, you know, that, that are of significance. And then a third time, again, as a narrative specifically of digital platforms, social and technical systems, coupled together with bitter conflict and community trauma. So our shared traumas actually uh, bind us together as much as our shared business practices. And I think that that's important to say. And that will lead us, of course, to the natural endpoint, which is, as you know, bear crimes, uh, honey heist, which you read for today, and the the uh, uh, and and corresponding literature related to that. So I'm I'm sort of again um, re reminded that that nothing is ever purely design, nothing is ever purely play culture. Play culture cannot be divorced from technology, and of course, when people play. Um, they're, they're, they're going to subvert all of those things. They're going to subvert the design. They're going to, you know, move in and out of various established norms among the culture. And uh, they're going to do things with, with, with various technologies in order to do it. Um, and, and I should also say that indie games is a social movement, which is really uncomfortable because not, all, not everybody wanted to be part of that movement. Not everybody uh, wanted to be included that way, but then also uh, without us being a social movement, we couldn't have accomplished anything um, in, in a collective. Um, so it's got like moral standards, community norms, ideological scuffles, and general best practices. Um, and and uh, I should say that the, most of the games I'm going to be talking about, like you know, Dungeons and Dragons, obviously you've heard of, that's not an indie game, it's sort of the opposite. And, and most of the games I'm going to be talking about are like the small, tiny fraction of a fraction of 1% of the market. And uh, it's also a thing that we're relatively cool with. So um, let's, let's get started. Take number one, my own timeline. I got into role-playing games about 30 years ago with uh, TSR's Marvel Super Heroes Advanced set. So not an indie game and very much a major IP, but not Dungeons and Dragons. This is when I was growing up in the college town of Iowa City, Iowa. Um, I bought that game with paper root money because it looked cool. That's the only reason why I bought it, it looked cool. Uh, but upon opening the box and perusing the rules, I realized I didn't understand a word. Of it. it didn't make any sense. I guess you have these figures and this map and these rules. And like, like there was this map of several different city blocks and stand up uh, paper miniatures of things like Spider-Man and the thing. But there were also rules for just sitting around and telling a story. Well, I like telling stories. So I get my bored friends at the after school program to tell stories with me using this game or at least the alibi of the game, because it was weird. We would use the rule books to build our own superheroes and we'd really carefully build them out of stats, abilities, and traits. Um, that was, those were the phase rip days. So fighting, fighting ability, agility, strength, endurance, reason, intuition, and psyche, where your stats phase rip is what it's spelled. And there was a period of my life where all of my school book drawings were just me writing phase rip next to them and statting out the drawing, right? So I like draw like a you know, a lizard monster. And then I'd be like, oh, I think it has an amazing strength, right? And, and this kind of thing. So I was thinking through, through everything in this kind of game um, framework. But when we got to play the game itself with its paper minis, its maps, all of our ridiculous characters, we just made up whatever we wanted. We didn't really pay attention to that system. We were nine. I mean, what do you want? So we were kind of both obsessed with the trappings of this unusual game while also un ultimately just able to shed them and, uh, and uh, do whatever we wanted. Uh, one of our group would also sit and play air. He, he says, I'm, I'm playing air. 
And, and that was because he just wanted to hang out and be involved, right? So I guess when we were out in space, he, he, was, he, he had less of a presence, but he was always there. And, and uh, when um, uh, he didn't have to then take on the stressful role of game mastering or playing, and, and especially because it was in hindsight kind of stressful that there were these rules in this book that we were just not following and we were all okay with it. And he, he wanted to see what we were doing. Um, the friends in this group were mixed race and they were a mixed religious group of Midwestern boys all. And we all kind of wound up in different walks of life. I, I became a college professor. Uh, we have programmers for Google, a UPS driver, a lawyer for the EPA, IT support, a gourmet chef and a beer brewer. That was our group, right? So that was our lives trajectories afterwards. Um, I'm just noting the diversity of the folks in the early 90s, uh, nerdy kid circles, because um, uh, it wasn't just for, for um, you know, me, right? And actually, we then merged into this group. There was this group of bright young girls who had, had gotten into Dragonlance about the same time, Dragonlance books. But they were game for playing all kinds of things. So we tried World of Darkness. We, we did Cyberpunk 2020. Uh, the White Wolf Street Fighter storytelling game, and we could we we it was just sort of this very um, semi thriving, lively hobby uh, um, culture that we were part of. That also uh, was based on the fact that we could go and buy the books straight up from our local hobby and game stores, of which there were several in town with very good selections. We were so spoiled, and then went to into our carpeted suburban basements of our parents' homes. Now during junior high. A student teacher in my reading class taught Chester Aaron's Lackawanna with a novel, which is from the 80s, um, using a rudimentary GURPS-based role-playing game in class. I didn't learn what GURPS was at that time. That teacher was Chris Mordica, and he had a huge impact on me as a gamer and beyond. He had gone to Grinnell College, where I would then go on to, to school and wind up six years later. And he had actually written chunks of the Marvel phase rip system that got me started on role-playing games. Uh, I, I, books I owned had his name in them, which I discovered later. Oh my God. It, but he was also a major figure in local game organizing. And he basically had to start an RPG club. We started really being encouraged to run different types of RPGs. We almost never ran Dungeons and Dragons in this club. And he encouraged me to go to the local gaming convention, Gamacon. Um, so uh, again, we, we were very much early on encouraged to try different systems and also adapt different content to that different system. So we'd like take our favorite video game and try it out. And it wouldn't work that well, but we would, you know, we'd have fun. And, and we learned something. Um, and then Chris actually got me to run my first convention game, which is again, me as like a junior high kid running for 30 year olds at the convention. So when Aaron talks about how confident I am in running games, it's because I've just been running games for total strangers for a really, really long time. And, and you know, where people were, you know, getting good at theater or jazz band or something in, in high school, I was getting very good at game mastering. Um, so I was sort of a regular there and I got to know all these different micro celebrities and, um, and even uh, got to know Chris Clark of Inner City Games, but a direct line to Gary Gygax. I ran Legendary Adventures and Gary Gygax heard about it and wanted me to do a write up and I thought oh, I'll get to that and then Gary Gygax died eight, to eight years later and I never got to it. Um, I, I guess um, my what was very characteristic of my activity at the time was I would pitch my games of these various systems, right? It would be like Cyberpunk 2020. I'm going to run a one shot. So four hour game with throwaway characters, you know, and that. But almost 50% of my games never ran. I must have had nerves of steel because I just kept trying. Uh, but almost, I have to say this, when I, whenever I put a non Dungeons and Dragons game on the schedule, which was all the time, I just had to be cool with the fact that half my games would never run. Sometimes I would, I would get my friends, sometimes I even paid my friends, once I even paid my friends to come and be plants, to write their names on, to, to join my table. So that then enough people would be like, oh, there are already two people signed up for this game, so maybe I'll sign up too. And, and, and then, then we had enough people to play. And of course, like once, once we got started running, it was fine, but I had to really adjust to the fact of being the lone person at the convention also, usually, you know, one of like three Jewish people at the convention uh, uh, running a non-conventional game in a sea of Dungeons and Dragons players, right? Eventually, though, and this is very important, um, it got to be too much. In order to keep certain friends, 
I wound up playing AD&D quite a lot in the late 90s. And not because I liked it, but because, you know, that's what they were doing. And if I wanted to hang out with them, I needed to do it. So I joined the RPGA, which is an organized play network that kept track of your D&D character's progress and so forth. Notably, RPGA had way fewer women than our regular gaming groups from junior high and way fewer people of color. It was very distinctly white, very distinctly male, and distinctly, I should say this, also filled with drama. These men complained all the time about their hobby, about the chaotic way that organized play was run, about various people in the convention circuit. And, and this is, of course, my true introduction to industry gossip, but also to, the, I think, the darker side of gamer culture. There, there are RPGA players who would, for example, grind Dungeons and Dragons modules while in their vans on the way to Gen Con from, from Iowa to, to Milwaukee, where Gen Con was being hosted at the time. And they had no good or affordable food or places to sleep. They just gamed, apparently. And, but they would, you know, kind of push their physical limits in order to get experience points for their characters. So if you think about that with later on with uh, World of Warcraft, massively multiplayer online RPGs. People were doing this in the analog world beforehand, right? If you, you say there were eight modules that came out and you wanted to play them all and you only had 12 hours, right? How do you do that? Well, people found ways. So by the end of the 1990s, early 2000s, uh, one of the owners of a local gaming store plummeted from organizing major conventions to being arrested on sales tax fraud, to working at the local Target, to then committing suicide. So when I went to college, I found out that I really enjoyed game mastering events, uh, but I really detested gamer culture, right? And, and, and the loneliness it produced in people, the toxicity, the fact that people uh, were, were always complaining about each other and, and always like gaming the system to try to get an edge on each other. Um, it was at college that I met Tor Erickson, who was two years my senior, and he introduced me to a small website called The Forge, right? Uh, the Forge was this like this cool website where people would discuss all these independent RPGs. And uh, I hadn't heard of any of them. I mean, they, they would discuss RPGs that like I played and ran, but that was not that important to them. What, they, what was really important to them was were these weird other games that they were working on that were like wild new hacks of those other games. And, um, and so I tried these experimental games. I tried running some of them, such as The Pool, or um, uh, I remember running Dust Devils, uh, Sorcerer, and most of those, those sucked. They, didn't, they, they weren't very good uh, as, as actual games uh, for, for me to run, or at least I didn't understand them. But I learned a whole lot of ga from, about game design from each run of each game because the, the game economies were so interesting. Um, the only problem is that when I jumped onto the forum, the Forge forum back then, it was dominated by this blowhard named Ron Edwards who would badger and bully all the posters into submission, um, making a pretty hostile environment for a college student overall. So I just lurked and I read, I played some of the games. I started attending Origins and Origins, two things happened at Origins. One is I met Todd Furler there. Todd Furler is the best game master in the biz. I will st stand by that. He's a, a gay man from, from Eastern uh, Pennsylvania and also uh, just the best sort of railroaded game master. He will have a plan. He has characters that go along with the plan that directly deal with the themes. And he shows me basically how game mastering is a grand illusion, a slate of hand that you do um, to kind of get players to consent to and surrender their agency. Um, the other person I met at Origins was uh, Brennan Taylor, who had started a company called Indie Press Revolution and was hawking these, these cool kind of smaller sized magazine, uh, or sorry, like indie um, magazine style games, like, like, like little zines. And, um, and there, of course, you know, was kind of the rulings versus the rules, right? Do you have a game master who so effortlessly manipulates the social situation so that, that you, you achieve your narrative results? Or do you write a rule book that, that, that incentivizes players to produce a certain type of play, right? So um, college, I ran a lot of uh, modern surrealist horror and, and, and cinematic games and, and kept reading along with The Forge. When I met Brennan Taylor, he said, oh, you're living in Western Massachusetts now. I said, yes, I'm going to grad school there. He says, well, you're living in the Mecca of indie RPGs. And I said, what, what do you mean? He's like, Vincent Baker lives there. Meg Baker lives there. Emily Kerr Boss lives there. Joshua A.C. Newman lives there. He's just rattling off all these names. I'm like, 
okay, well, I don't know any of these people, but I'll check. And, and, and sure enough, you know, they were sort of the folks who had really taken the forge um, theories and applied them in very useful ways, both in terms of theory, as well as in terms of practice. Um, and effectively in 2006, Emily Care Boss organized the first Jiffy Con, which is again a really quick, quick con, one day con um, uh, that uh, effectively, um, you know, brought us all together. And, um, and the rest is history. Like uh, from, from 2006 on, I've been sort of part of the Western Massachusetts, uh, the Game Collective. Um, you know, fast forward to there, I got a Fulbright in Berlin in, in 2009, 2010, and, and definitely then became part of the Nordic LARP scene by going to a festival in Denmark. Um, and the Nordic LARP scene has always been in, in dialogue with, with the indie game community, say, since 2008, 2009. Um, uh, after I came back, we, we really pushed down hard on this thing called Games on Demand, which is a... Uh, way of us hacking bigger conventions to hold our own little conventions in the middle of them. And that's been cool. So, and again, we put a little game menus which people can pick from without bias. And then, and then that game master will run the game. And one of the attraction points is often the creators of the games are pitching their own games and you can just play with a creator. Um, and uh, it's a, so I got involved in organizing that. Uh, by 2014, we had a journal called Analog Game Studies uh, same year, actually, we started a contest called the Golden Cobra Challenge, which is now in its, um, I guess this would be year nine, um, right? So uh, the Golden Cobra Challenge is about making accessible live action role playing games. Um, and and we, we encourage people to sort of follow very strict guidelines to create, again, whatever games they want. And they, of course, own the rights to those games. They can do whatever they want. The contest just publicizes them and then they can go and publish them if they want. Um, and then also that year, we held an important event in New York called Living Games, which was held in 2014, 2016, and 2018. Um, and that uh, formed one of the, I would say, now invisible communities of, of designers, scholars, et cetera, between the role-playing game communities and the academic communities, right? Um, and it, it died after 2018 for very good reasons. But, uh, but Living Games is one of those, those academic projects that, that also lives on through its community of practitioners who've gone on to do all kinds of things. Um, and, and, and that was, again, uh, the 2014 period on is from when I had this job and moved to Cincinnati. I was kind of isolated here, so I would do a lot of travel to, to role play. And that all ended, of course, in 2020 with the pandemic. And suddenly uh, I did a lot more sort of online organizing and online gaming. Um, the last couple of years I've been, been semi-active in certain capacities with the Gauntlet, which is an online um, gaming community, also publishing house. And they, to some degree, uh, have taken just the games on demand convention model and moved it online and, and, and taken a lot of our best practices and moved it online, but effectively, um, you know, I, I had a, a, a long history with, with this stuff and all of it comes through connections, right? If Chris Mordica hadn't come at that specific time, I wouldn't have like legitimated role-playing games so early. If, if then I hadn't met, you know, Todd and, and Brennan later on, then maybe I wouldn't have been in touch with Emily and then, then where would I be, right? And, and now, of course, you know, I'm in my late 30s. Most of these creators are now in their, their late 40s, early 50s. Um, we're, we're older and wiser now, uh, we're more bruised, but, but we still love the games that we, we run and we, we, we still love to produce and, uh, and, I'm, um, and, and ever since I started you know, writing proper games uh, since in 2011 on, um, you know, I feel very tied to, to the community though I don't make a cent from it. It costs me lots of money to participate in. I don't make any money from the indie games community, um, at least not directly. So let's let's tell this tale a second time. But Aaron, do I have screen sharing privileges? Well, in just a second. Uh, I'm just going to walk people through the RPG Geek pages of a, a, a very rapid succession of, of a bunch of games. You're set. Great. OK, so I guess uh, the, the, the the preface is that um, 
you know, Dungeons and Dragons is probably a game you've heard of. And in popular culture, it's the metonym for role-playing games. Uh, it, it's strange then in the early days that D&D didn't call itself a role-playing game. It was called Rules for Fantastic Medieval War Game Campaigns Playable with Paper and Pencil and Miniature Figures. And why did it start calling itself a role-playing game? Well, from late 1975 on, it started to. As, as John Peterson argues, uh, competing games cropped up very soon after D&D was first published and called themselves role-playing games uh, to distinguish themselves from the fantasy wargaming of D&D. And since D&D's publisher TSR was empire building at the time, it did what Confucius advised at, as the first step of conducting affairs of state, which is rectify the language. And so too, D&D became a role-playing game too, the role-playing game to model all role-playing games. But in its initial stages of existence, we can consider TSR an independent company, a small business. But it was under the threat, almost the, even right out the gate, of, from other independent publishers that pushed, pushed it to, to dominate the, the space. And, I, and I, I, I regret that it had to do that, actually. I actually didn't, I think we would be much better off if it hadn't done that. Because it turns out anybody can actually publish a tabletop RPG. Um, and we can still see like indie RPGs as being just this sort of counterpoint to the normative TSR uh, D&D Wizards of the Coast model. Um, but, but this is not, you know, so much defining the, the move, indie movement negatively in terms of the shadow cast by D&D, so much as positively evaluating the liberation and innovation of the indie tabletop RPG space. So, Again, the straight up definition of an indie game is simple. Indie RPGs are where the creator of the work also owns its rights. There, there we go. They, they're the ones who are able to decide on the next printing of their own RPG. It does, it, it's not held by some rights holder, it's held by them and they get to make that call. Um, so this encapsulates a wide range of material cover, covering an inexhaustible array of different designs and products from single page PDFs and low budget zines to high gloss games and boxes and hardcover book series. So there's no standard indie format. But uh, there are sort of three other important factors. One is the aesthetics, right? Not all RPGs feel the same and some are so weird that they feel like an indie RPG. So if you, if you know a game called Everway by Jonathan Tweet, it kind of feels like an indie RPG, even though it's put out by Wizards of the Coast, right? Um, the, uh, the second is that um, but once you have one employee that's not you, that you are paying a full salary to, you are not indie anymore. Sorry. You are what we call second tier or small press, and uh, that would be Evil Hat, Atlas Games, Chaosium, Seventh Sea, Magpie Games, and so forth. These all could have claimed the indie label in their beginnings, but you know, now raise millions in Kickstarter funds, et cetera, et cetera. So you know, second tier is what you graduate to after you are indie for a while, but maybe some people just remain indie. And then the third factor is the discursive function, which again is the muddle, like, you know, if are you morally indie? Are you, you know, authentic? Or what, you know, what, and, and again, this is all a shifting uh, field. But um, in any case, now is when I, I will give you a real short history with about 20 games very quickly. Um, the first game masterless game is a game called Engard, actually, by, um, by GDW. So this would be a, a game that we would consider to be very influential to the indie aesthetic, where again, we, we question the whole nature of what a role-playing game is, it's a play-by-mail non-game non master game. But at the same time, um, you know, uh, this, this, this game otherwise is put out by a major publisher or at least one that was indie at that time, right? So, um, the uh, on guard has its had its impact as like the first game masterless game, which of course you know is the is the um, is is where we um, we first jump away from from predominant um, in uh, D and D paradigms. Bunnies and Burrows would be another one. Um, this is 1976 by Scott Robinson and and Dennis Sestere. And it's published by Fantasy Games Unlimited. I just wanted to, to bring up Fantasy Games Unlimited because until 1987, they're sort of a holding and clearing house for all kinds of independent publishers. But they're questionably indie because again, 
the rights for the second publication or whatnot lie with Fantasy Games Unlimited and not with the creators. But still, at the time, if you wanted to, at the time being the mid 70s, if you wanted to think of which was the most indie of, of all the RPG publishing outfits, um, your best bet was, you know, Fantasy Game Unlimited. Uh, when you talk about what price glory, uh, what price glory is like a totally, you know, stapled um, uh, standard uh, kind of d d medieval combat clone. But again, done it totally self-published by John Dankert and Jim Laufenberger, completely, um, you know, sort of influenced by, by the California underground zines culture, which was very uh, much thriving at the time. And, uh, and what price glory still has, has this kind of place in as, as, oh, these, these guys like assembled a bunch of copies of this game. They stapled them together and they, they sold them and they got the money and they own the rights to them uh, very much within our business model. Um, I should mention White Bear and Red Moon and then RuneQuest, which is the, um, uh, w which has this very specific person attached to it um uh greg stafford greg stafford would would be considered the the father of of the modern indie games movement um particularly because you know he was somebody who always designed systems for you know the um the narrative situation you'd like, you'd like to place your characters in and not you know to universally handle any possible contingency so very focused bespoke design um, and, and RuneQuest, uh, of course, was the inspiration for Call of Cthulhu, uh, use, built on sort of the same bones. And that investigation system with its very problematic sanity mechanic all you know, stems from Stafford's kind of, kind of early work uh, with, with his team. Uh, I want to mention Toon. Again, Toon is by Greg Kostikian and Warren Spector from 1984. Um, uh, Greg Kostikian being a key theorist and Warren Spector, you know, from Deus Ex, Thief, uh, System Shock, uh, major video game designer, but uh, Warren Spector's impact on role-playing games is actually enormous. Uh, uh, Toon has extremely simple mechanics. It is, uh, it is comically simple because, you know, partially uh, you, you, you can see how it plays with the meta level of the role-playing game. If you make the game master laugh, you get plot points. And for some reason, this is this is up. There we go. Um, so so Tune is very much a, um, a a model again from our, our bespoke design, as well as uh, showcasing you know work of, of later very inspirational designers. And Tune would then lead to the ultimate indie game, which is the Bullwinkle and Rocky. A storytelling party game, just very necessary uh, from 1988. Uh, this is a uh, GMless card-based game in which you play to lose. Uh, it, it, again, not it has nothing uh, uh, to do with Dungeons and Dragons, but was put out by TSR. And Warren Spector and Dave Zeb Cook were the designers, and just a very unusual game. With, with a quirky premise. Um, and again, we, we, we take this, this game as a, as a sign of, of, of what, what it is, what's to come, what, is, what will become our space of our quirky storytelling uh, games with w w which we're trying to emulate certain weird genres or, um, or stories. Ars Magica. Um, Ars Magica is a troop-based game where you're, you're playing out a medieval like town as well as as a castle with a wizard in it. And um, basically, you know, you sort of play through the seasons, but then also it's very easy to pass off game master duties. Ars Magica was very inspirational for the bakers as well as Emily Kerr Boss, because they had a shared campaign with this and, and, and were able to do years worth of world building as well as shared and collaborative storytelling um, using, using Ars Magica. Um, it was also created by Mark Reinhagen, who would then do Vampire the Masquerade. Over the Edge. This Over the Edge was Jonathan Tweet deciding, again, based on sort of uh, zine uh, letters at the time, to, he wanted to make a postmodern uh, game that was basically a psycho-surrealist game. What, it, what if William S. Burroughs did an RPG? Um, and 
uh, again, very, very stripped down design by then fairly indie uh, uh, press Atlas Games and and in, in it, again influential on on later designs. Um, Bestial Axe. It's a game about um, a, a plane crash in the snow and cannibalism. It's a Brechtian game. Most notably, is it, Greg Kostikian published this on a web page. It's an HTML web page that you can just scroll down and do the rules. I don't know anyone who's ever played this, but uh, this is the kind of thing that people would post before you know the Forge and before PDFs, right? Is you know you would just throw some stuff on a web page and be like, "Ha, this is my game." And you know what? No one could tell him he couldn't do that. And he had a successful career afterwards. On the opposite end of the spectrum, again, also by Greg Kostikian's later publisher, um, James Wallace, was The Extraordinary Adventures of Baron Munchausen, which pretty much is a GM-less freeform game that you're supposed to play while drinking. Um, you, you have uh, a bunch of 18th century noblemen telling outlandish stories and, the, uh, and, there, and there's a simple wager mechanic. It's extremely easy to play. Um, and you're, you're sort of, um, uh, the, the, the interesting part about this is, is that most of the book isn't the game. Most of the book is just outlandish storytelling, but then the cool thing is you, uh, you, you already know most of what the, the game is going to be like by reading the book. And, and then, and then the rules are just like sort of a side note. Let's pull, pull up our, um, our next round of games and again we're just we're just giving you the the very brief brief tour of what 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 there is out there um not 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 and again it, it, it's american centric this is this is much more a story of my community rather than the indie community because if someone was here from you know the osr or fantasy heartbreaker kind of communities they would they would tell a different story and i think that's great I'm glad that other people have other stories to tell. Uh, Sorcerer is the game that uh, that Ron Edwards published in 2001, and already in 1998 he wrote a, a famous essay called "The Nuked Apple Cart," in which he's pretty much uh, fed up with with the publishing means of of RPGs in the 90s. And I, I'll get to that in in sort of the third the third telling of the story. Um, is that 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 he he got very very angry at at kind of the splat book culture of of the late 90s and and their inefficient design and sorcerer was his response for that i don't know if sorcerer is a fantastic game but one thing that he did was he crammed in a bunch of discussions of rpg theory at the end of the book and he could he couldn't stop himself he has had always the put a little chunk of more rpg theory at the at the end of the books and, and bless ron and then and then then uh you know so he got people thinking about okay what is the design of my game and 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 this is again uh, one of the major designs associated with the forge my life with master being another one my life with master you're playing servants of an evil master or mistress um, you are basically like, yes, master, no master, and being sort of dom, you know, dominated by your master. And, and it's not really a, it's a very asymmetrical game, but um, uh, it had enough meat to it. And it had a really attractive cover, right? And that's, that, that's where my life with master kind of took, took on this, um, this quality of, oh, this is, this is something different and something new and cool in RPGs. Dogs in the Vineyard is about Mormon cowboys patrolling people in the West. It was printed at our local print shop in Western Massachusetts. And um, interestingly enough, because Vincent Baker is now, uh, I think, totally uh, in favor of indigenous communities and against kind of the violence of the Westerns, this is not a game that will ever be in print ever again. Um, suddenly making all our copies very valuable, I guess. But but he's he's chosen not to reprint this one. Um, it was it was famed at the time for creating an innovative um, way of escalating conflicts from just talking to knife fighting to shooting, and uh, reflecting the way that that things can get out of hand and break down into violence. Breaking the Ice by Emily Kerr Boss, also from my community, is a dating game. You have to swap genders of you know what your um, you know, so if I, I I'm I, if I'm a man, I'm going to be playing a woman in the scenario, and then we go on three different dates, 
and see if our characters are compatible. Um, there were not games about romantic dating at the time, but now they are. You know, Emily Care Bros brought them in, and and also that that it was very thoughtful from from the structures of how um, how the characters are set up in relation to to each other. Um, Steelway Jordan, also from our community. This one is telling stories such as uh, Tony Morrison's Beloved or, or Margaret Walker's Jubilee. Yes, I, I, Tobin, had a, Tobin wanted to tell me that he had a kid in his class named, named Jordan. Okay, anyway, where were we? So, so Steelway Jordan um, is, is uh, basically participating in sort of the oral slave narratives, um, you know, that were collected in the, in the 1930s by the WPA, but then also, you know, uh, again, uh, Toni Morrison's beloved and Octavia Butler's kindred kind of then transform into um, modern fiction. And um, this was a game that both um, wowed us at the time and also was ruthlessly attacked. Um, it, it was was using, you know, sort of um, uh, the the core functions of a role playing game. So randomizers, chance. There's a skull die that if you roll a skull on it, you die, right? I mean, it's got it's very brutal in that way. You don't get to choose your own name the game master chooses your own name. So really mechanizes the, these, these particular um, aspects um, to, uh, of, of the role-playing game uh, in, in response to, um, to slavery and slave narratives. Um, Can you help me with something? I can't, Tobin, I'm sorry. Uh, it, okay, I've, got, I've got a child who is, who's entered the chat. Um, yeah. Um, great. Steelway Jordan is, is interesting um, insofar as once you start playing the game, it's actually quite, uh, quite entertaining insofar as um, you, you get to keep your secrets from the master, also from the game master, and you hide those goals. And as you accomplish those hidden goals that they don't know about, you get points and, 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 and are able to, to you know, get further advantage, uh, which is amazing. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I, I watched lots of white gamers just be like, well, this isn't my history, so I'm not gonna do that and, and, and other kinds of, of, of things. And, and um, I, I think that, that this game, you know, deserves a lot of more praise than, than it gets for um, shifting the conversation about what indie RPGs can do, especially with the language of role playing. Um, Fiasco by Jason Morningstar in 2008, uh, pretty much then at this time, uh, takes these, these what we call stake setting games in the wake of My Life with Master and Dogs in the Vineyard, where you're at a very big meta level. And I also forgot to put Primetime Adventures in here. That's another big one where you're making a TV show. But basically, you know, oftentimes you're going to meta level talk about a scene and then you're going to do the scene and then you're going to do the outcome. That was that was the design of the games at the time. The, the, um, the, the cool thing about Fiasco is it streamlines all of that. It, it streamlines line, it down to the point where you um, are really um, you know, smoothly playing through the game without a whole lot of negotiation. So um, even more sort of influential was Apocalypse World. Apocalypse World hits our community in 2010. I was in the second Apocalypse World campaign uh, run by Meg Baker. And it's a pretty much then you know, was, was Vincent saying, well, I'm not making a lot of money in indie games, so how can I make a popular game that people will, will like? And he did. And, uh, he did actually set out to, to make something that had identifiable RPG characteristics, stats, experience points, advancement, uh, and, and, and then build in, he built in sort of all of the accoutrements of our, our uh, story games. So hard choices, playing to lose, um, negotiation and consent. And that created a thing called Powered by the Apocalypse that's just been massively influential ever since. Um, the Quiet Year is a Powered by the Apocalypse game uh, by Avery Alder that uses cards and is used for world building. Um, Alex Roberts for the Queen is built on it. And so, uh, so is um, 
Laura Simpson's The Companion's Table, Tale, and any number of other games. It's just, just a map making game, but also about how communities break down and have, uh, uh, you know, passive aggressive relations. Blades in the Dark, uh, another apocalypse world hack, and, and a, uh, a, a, what happens when you hack apocalypse world so much it becomes its own system. This was this was a influential game in which you're sort of um, in in a fantasy steampunk environment where all of your um, uh, heists uh, are in media res. Um, this this actually was a kind of was inspired by another game called Project Dark by Will Highmarch that was uh, promised and kickstarted many years ago and still not yet delivered. But Will's Will's been steadily working on it. But uh, you know, he even uh, uh, John Harper, who did Blades in the Dark, credits Will and it's like, oh, yeah, man, yeah, dude, I, you know, I, I, I definitely uh, I mean, was inspired by your game. And finally, oops, and then finally we have Honey Heist. Um, uh, let's close Blades in the Dark. Uh, Honey Heist is, of course, this uh, bear crimes game. There's the game. It's just like one page. Um, Honey Pie Heist was 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 prefaced by, or sorry, predated by um, Epi Ravichol's Vast and Starlet, um, and um, and and other what we call micro games or nano games that that are definitely uh, there to be kind of business cards to show off your cool things that you you can do as an RPG designer and cost almost nothing either for you or for the customer. Uh, Honey Heist was just an image posted on Imgur, and and I can I maybe talk a little bit more about the 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 um, the story of that once I scroll to that part in this talk. So um, so again, I think um, Honey Heist um, is is again. Uh, was released by Grant Howitt um, on itch.io and on, on the image sharing platform Imgur, which is actually part of, him, of Grant Howitt promoting another platform, which is Patreon. It's a handwritten game with crude bear drawings, and it's about bears stealing honey using their two stats, bear and criminal. Uh, and again, Vast and Starlet and, and Lasers and Feelings uh, uh, by John Harper, they all have two stats. It's all kind of a, a, a general design mode of our community. Uh, the bears disguise themselves as crucial times in order to steal the honey. Before we dismiss this content as silly, though, uh, we can appreciate the game's deep structures. Uh, succeeding or losing moves points around between criminal and bear, respectively. If either score gets too high, the game is over. Therefore, there is an informal chance-based time limit for the heist, the obstacles of which can be also be randomly generated by the game master, as you can see from the PDF. So we have to accept our mixed nature as bear criminals or be overcome by the forces that permit us to steal the, the, the honey in the first place. And as Chase Carter describes it, this came struck a chord with the internet, becoming one of the top posts of all time in the RPG subreddit and raking in tens of thousands of views on the original Imgur upload. Critical Role, the most popular actual place show for tabletop games, featured Honey Heist in three separate videos in late 2017. And um, the uh, giving what might, might have been a flash in the pan momentum to change the entire tabletop RPG landscape from 2017 on. So again, we can reflect on digital platforms and the business model's active role in making Honey Heist a smash hit. The complete handwritten game was scanned and posted as a .jpg image on Imgur, a platform that profits from algorithmic advertising. So how its game was in theory, just another piece of digital content waiting to be transformed into attention metrics. So that attention could then be sold in micro auctions to digital advertisers. Same goes for Reddit. With enough eyeballs on this crude bear tabletop RPG, it then got the attention of Critical Role, an internet broadcast tabletop RPG show, also reliant on attention metrics for revenue. But the Bear TRPG was distributed for free on Imgur and later on itch.io because the game itself functioned as a kind of business card or ad for Grant Howitt's Patreon, a paid subscription in, uh, service that promises one game a month downloadable from the Patreon page or from monthly emails to subscribers' accounts. A hand-drawn, simple tabletop RPG became famous because of the feedback loops of various profit models all working in tandem. And of course, with virality, all, you know, 
working alongside that. But you know, how it's amazing TRPG success has deeper roots, also digital. Uh, how it's game is a hack of John Harper's Lasers and Feelings game, which is an homage to both the song by the Double Clicks, Lasers and Feelings, and Space Opera in general. And Lasers and Feelings comes from Vast and Starlet, uh, Epi Ravichol's original, you know, micro nano game. Um, Lasers and Feelings was a freely downloadable PDF. One that was exquisitely laid out and, and thought through, which was sort of John Harper's signature style. You know, he in the, the early days would would um, and, and this happened with his 2011 game Lady Blackbird. He would you know lay out these games quite gorgeously, and then he'd release the PDF for free. It was very it was very good for him. In in and and then he could ad advertise his non free tabletop RPGs such as Aegon. Um, so reducing lasers and feelings, a game about a crew exploring space as their captain lies in a coma, just to advertising also misses the point because the game is part of a wider internet discussion on so-called nano games or micro RPGs or business sized uh, TRPGs. Um, again, when, when people needed a calling card game that demonstrated their design chops in an efficient and easily transportable form. So you, I might not pay $10 for a, your game at a convention or $20. This is when conventions were, were going hot, but I might pay a dollar for your game. Um, so at the indie RPG uh, community at the time, openly mixed promotion of TRPG products with discussions about design and limits thereof and how it acknowledges the debt he owes to all these earlier scene activities, and thus his bear game has been more or less by a stroke of luck, chosen by algorithm, propagated wildly as a work of individual genius, rather than as just another entry in a widespread community dialogue among global tabletop RPG designers, right? And um, I think I'm gonna cut the, the, the th third part of the story uh, short, but, but more or less to say that, that Honey Heist, you know, emerges from this 2017 uh, historical moment but has in fact these deep histories and those deep histories are parallel to what um, you know my own deep histories in the scene and most of this this analog game history is digital right it, it involves us going on forums uh, meeting in these these various digital spaces you navigating various digital platforms and trying to um, trying to just get a handle on on making even a small amount of money in a very contested uh, space. And with that, I'm going to just open things up for chat questions and, and talking about anything you'd like. Thank you so much for listening to me, Gab. I got, I got, got, got a, a, a question from Chris already up and uh, I've got, I've got an, 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 another couple, uh, yeah, another couple. So, so Chris, take it away. Hi, so uh, something I'm always interested in with tabletop games is the core dice system, but I, like it's hard to find the time to like, you know, dig into a game to find out how its system works. So since you clearly got experience with several dice systems, I really wanted to know what just a couple of your favorite ones are or some ones that you think are really interesting mechanically. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I would say uh, I, I like games that defetishize the dice. Uh, key in that is, are not only Fiasco, but A Thousand One Nights, um, which means that your, your dice roll outcome is going to produce an A or B outcome rather than a um, success or failure outcome. Um, oftentimes, you know, you roll a die and then you, you check it against the table or some stats, and then that produces a success or a failure, except like again if you fail to climb the wall in the adventure is that interesting i mean hopefully the game master makes it interesting but frequently they don't frequently they're like whiff you whiff does anyone else want to try to call, climb the wall it's not taken as a storytelling opportunity which which uh is too bad um uh, what 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 i prefer is is okay you have an a option which is you climb the wall but you you meet um you, you, your arch enemy at the top of it, or the B option, which is you don't climb the wall um, and you successfully um, infiltrate the castle, but only through crawling through the worst, muckiest part of the moat. Right now, you've now you you've generated two different story branches rather than you know rewarded or punished the player. Um, and and again, a thousand one nights uh, basically even has you. Um, collecting the, the dice as what, what, what Meg Baker calls gems, and then 
you roll them afterwards and a roll then produces, you know, more or less the result of like, are you going to be imprisoned in this court forever? Are you going to be decapitated? Right. And, and, and it's, it's kind of wholly divorced from what went on in the story, but then you have to kind of then um, make that relation. And that is uh, actually more fun than, than, than you'd think. Um, so a fiasco is another one where it's like, well, the dice could more or less determine, um, are you, um, are things going generally well for you or not? But it's a game about catastrophic failure. So things not going well for you is good uh, often. Uh, so the, I, think, I think my answer is, does, does the dice help give me you know, more, more thread for, for, for improvisational storytelling or does it shut that down? That, that's going to be my main um, uh, you know, appraisal of any dice mechanic whenever I see it. Thank you. Looks like, like uh, Matthew. Hi, so I had a couple questions, some big or some small. Um, I think I'll go with the big one first is, how would you, so with with you evaluating and discussing so many indie RPGs, I'm assuming you know how like the process for making a lot of them. So yeah. how would you go about making an indie RPG, uh, specifically one that's DMless? Uh, if those seem to, uh, right now I find very fascinating, and I just don't know how you'd go about making one. <laughs> I think the best way to do that, Matthew, is to play some DMOS link games first, actually, to really uh, immerse yourself. One of the cool articles related to that is actually by um, Jason Morningstar and Emily Care Boss, and um, even Vagi called Beyond the Game Master. And that is from, I believe it's the 2012 States of Play Solmukota book. I can look up the the URL for you, Matthew, but, but um, read that. It has a bunch of examples and play like two or three of them until you're like, okay, I get it. Um, but but, but, but the, the, the short um, answer is a game master, all they are is a, bu a bunch of responsibilities collected in one particular role. If you spell out all the responsibilities, you can distribute them too. And that 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 is the that is the solution, the design solution that our community uh, sought. Now, twenty years down the line, somebody may come up with something that's way more elegant than even that, and I'm excited to see that happen. Um, but you know, at, at at this point, it's like okay, game master does X, Y, and Z, right? They control the NPCs, they 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 arbitrate, you know, conflicts, whatever. What if all of that was decentralized or assigned to different players? Okay. Um, another question would be, so in, in all your time working in the indie scene, what is the biggest mistake or failure that you have personally done or that you have seen done by others? Um, good question. Um, a big mistake is um, thinking that no one's watching when you're doing things. Um, that, uh, you know, I, I ran a game, uh, Metropolis based on the Fritz Lang film, um, at the 2012, um, uh, festival. And it was almost immediately stolen by somebody who's now a friend of mine. Right. But, 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 you know, he did basically wholeheartedly lift the thing I did and turn it into something else that was still too close to the original thing for comfort. Um, that kind of uh, quote unquote stealing is um, fine as long as you have a ludography, uh, ludography in which you, you give credit to people. Like actually hacking is perfectly fine and saying, oh, I just wholesale took this thing and then just made it slightly different. But you have to acknowledge that people are there or else they might run, run around and find your thing. And, you know, there's hardly any money that's really I mean, like money as in like big time money circulating in there. So it's all status, right? It's all reciprocity. People seeing each other, playing each other's games and whatnot. And so if you're inspired by a thing or quote unquote stealing from it, just mention it in your text. And, and then, then, then you're part of the great 
chain of being. But if you just are like, I'm a genius and I have this, this idea, then the people who are in the community who, who know who, you know, who the real geniuses are or that, that there are multiple people behind that idea. I mean, you know, that, that is, and, and, and you think, oh, but I'm indie, no one's watching. People, yeah, people are watching all the time. They'll find your games and collections. They'll, they'll find you. And so, so always credit where you find things, uh, credit your inspirations and also, and, and shout out the people that, that are, you know, kind of in the same orbit as that game because they'll see. All right, thank you so much. Thank you, Alex. Yeah, hi. Um, so I, I wanted to return to your briefly to your sort of narratives you were uh, developing around um, uh, platforms and sort of you know game development ecosystems, and, and this is something I, I am interested in a lot as well. One thing I would love to get your thoughts on is where you see, and I don't know actually know if you were how in touch you were with this space, but like where you see sort of Google Plus. Um, were you were you in the Google Plus scene at all? Was that yes? The the the, the answer is intimately. The answer is okay. intimately. I, I was I was part of that, and Google Plus was part of my talk that I axed. Uh, I can get into the Google Plus part of that talk, uh, uh, but but the the effective answer is yes. Google Plus between 2011 to 2019 is an absolutely vital chapter, and also deleted right a, a vital mm -hmm. deleted chapter of RPG theory and development. A lot of the big names that are quote unquote big now, um, including Magpie Games or the, the, the folks behind um, a, lot, a lot of the uh, Ravenloft, uh, 5e supplement and whatever, all those people networked through Google Plus. And then they networked in Google Plus and then they, they met in real life. And uh, you know, it, uh, th those, those networks and, commu and, and, and communications formed and you're like, oh, okay, well, what, how do they, all these people know each other and work on a thing? Well, they, they, met, they met there on this, this social network. So Google Plus was a social media platform that Google added involuntarily to Gmail and, and that then for some reason, us role players gravitated to it. And when I actually say for some reason, there are very real platform reasons. Um, we were able to, to have a very strong barrier of who was in a group and who was out of a group. We were able to uh, create blog like po length posts, so not like Twitter where you have to do hot takes, but really proper blog length posts and simply decide who could see them or not, um, which, was, which was terrific, except um, there were certain uh, bullies and abusers who absolutely took advantage of that precise space. They could make anonymous accounts and run ragged through that space, especially if there was a maybe a big a person who who was particularly prominent in the community who didn't patrol their 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 follows very well and then so suddenly they would get folded in on various things i mean and it, there, were, there were a lot of bad actors in that space but there were also a lot of tools that you yourself had as a participant to block or circumvent the, the bad actors or really you know uh create a nice circle so for me you know if you follow me on twitter you're gonna get like some complaining about stuff and some role-playing game theory and some German cinema stuff because I'm a German cinema scholar and then some shit posting. And all of that was separate for me on Google+. Plus. I, could, I had a shit post channel that actually I think I had thousands of followers who just watched me like make up dumb memes at like 3 a.m. And that was that was, like that was very satisfying to me because because I was connecting with the right audience, and that, then then my professional audience didn't have to see that, right? And um, so so yes, I think uh, ultimately, you know, where I'm going with with the research here, and again, this is partially my personal narrative plus some of my research, is to argue about the centrality of platforms in. Um, in, in indie development, dating back to the 70s, even looking at the photocopier and others as the platforms. And then second to, um, I, I think, uh, highlight the indie developer as the sort of modern neoliberal entrepreneur involuntarily. They don't, want, they don't mean to be neoliberal entrepreneurs. They just are. They, they, they're the early ones in Patreon. They're the early ones on Kickstarter. They're the early you know, adopters of, of any new monetary mechanism because there's so little money that, and, and they're so, you know, they're so cash starved and they, they, and they still have to print up books. So what do you do? You adopt the latest, you know, tech fad. 
Um, uh, there are other reasons for it too, but but I I mean that's you know that's where I'm at. Um, while the room thinks up another question or so, um, please people queue in um, while we have some time left. Um, I want to give you an opportunity to um, talk a little about Diamond Twenty, the game that you're. Oh <laughs> yeah, okay. I'll, I'll I'll give you a preview of Diamond Twenty. Um, so so I write a lot of I would say since. Um, 2016 or so I've I, I've written quite a lot of like uh queer polyamorous games a lot a lot of them are, are like weird freeform or LARP mixtures and then Diamond 20 is like my queer polyamorous tabletop action figure game and if that sounds weird to you just stay with the weirdness you know don't uh, <laughs> don't don't uh, don't let it scare you so I can just share the screen right on the on the actual doc here um, so Diamond 20, um, again, sort of based on, uh, there's, there's our cover. I'm working with artist Kyle Latino on it, and, um, and we are pr pr you know, uh, presenting it at Fostival. Um, one of the things that, that it, it comes from is actual child's play, but it also uh, is effectively uh, a bunch of tarot cards, and you're going to have 20 characters. So I'll, I'll scroll down to the characters, right? And, there, there are character cards, which again, um, resemble kind of like our 1990s uh, trading cards that we had while we were growing up. And um, they're kind of superficial, right? They're, no one really has any stats or whatnot. And that's because it's everything sort of based around like a, a consensual voting mechanism to, to decide outcomes. But then, you know, the, the characters are kind of these, you know, genderqueer, uh, um, strange, um, uh beings that that are all like guardians of this 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 um uh sorry the, the, this this land called vivia here we are you know vivia is an actual like mapped out you know gorgeous looking landscape that that you traverse but then the diamond in the diamond 20 is you make a diamond let's see i, I hope i don't make anyone sick but i'm gonna do a rapid scroll up to see if i can get to a, the diamond diagram uh there's a diamond right so there's a diamond so you'll you'll see all of the different characters arrayed before you this game takes up an enormous amount of table space like it's a tabletop game you need a three foot by three foot table minimum to run this game uh unless you want to use floor space or an, a second table um and 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 it's kind of like opulent and extravagant because we can do it right we're just going to throw this on drive through cards afterwards we're not going to um you know, try and pitch it to a publisher. We're not going to crowdfund it. We are going to simply throw it up there and, 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 you know, kind of streamline it obviously for, for a wider audience, but, but, but th things like, oh, this is going to take up too much table space is not an, a factor for us. Um, we, we more or less, um, uh, again, you, you arrange everything in this kind of diamond shape. You, you, you put the rebel, uh, against the tyrant at the top and the tyrant you're fighting who's one of your own one of your own 20 guardians at the bottom and so you have to struggle with the fact that one of your your own has has you know decided to go amok and, and become a tyrant and you have to go down the diamond and recruit everybody but maybe you're fighting them or maybe you're dating them you know there is various options way, ways that you can deal with that and so it is actually possible for you to date your way through the whole diamond it'll take a while but you can go on a lot of dates and you know see how how your you know motorcycle looking mofo goes well with the walrus looking mofo right and uh you know it, i i don't really know how else to describe it except uh you know most of most of the games that i design that win awards or have any kind of recognition or power come from really deep child's play principles that i then implement in rpg form and this is this is one of those where i think okay when i was six or seven here's how i play with my action figures it was kind of strange then but so play is strange and let's embrace it let's do it so that's that's a little bit about Diamond Twenty. It, 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 I'm I'm very proud of this game, and it will it will debut in April at Festival. We'll tweak it a little bit, and and then we'll we'll put it out for for general public to buy it. Especially because 
uh, Kyle is a working artist and he needs money. So I want to make sure that everybody is getting getting paid and and getting uh, uh, at least you know their money back for for the investment in this. We got another another question from Matthew. Hi. So I was kind of curious. Um, so for do you have a favorite RPG and do you think there is any single RPG that is the most influential? Uh, the single RPG that's most influential is Dungeons and Dragons, unfortunately. Okay, well then, then what about single indie RPG that's most influential? The single indie RPG now most influ influential is without a doubt Apocalypse World. I mean, Apocalypse mm -hmm. World is is the game that that created Kickstarter worthy genre um, uh, RPGs. So. Uh, if you saw the Avatar The Last Airbender uh, Kickstarter, it got $9 million, right? That team, too, is, is, is primarily women, primarily people of color. It is, it is you know, in consultation with, with, um, with East Asian and other affected communities by the RPG. They are involved it, with, with um, you know, with things in a way that a corporate... Um, uh, press probably wouldn't be, but then also the powered by the apocalypse um, dimension allows them to uh, to re to really design for what Avatar should feel like, rather than what uh, whatever standardized system um, you know people are bringing to the table. Uh, which is why whenever you know something is adapted for Five E for Dungeons and Dragons Fifth Edition on on you know when they say stay Dark Souls, the RPG is going to come out on Five E or Doctor Who, you know, obviously those studios are saying, well, we want to make some money because that's a, that's a huge audience and, and I don't fault them for it. I think that's fine. The, 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 the issue is that 5e is not the best for running Doctor Who or Dark Souls in the estimation of the indie community. And, and, and also uh, for Avatar, probably, probably 5e is probably not the best thing. So uh, Powered by the Apocalypse is there for them with the genre RPG. I mean, really, it basically uh, allows people to um, to design for those hard choices, right? Those difficult moments of of, of wrath decision that that make uh, storytelling suspenseful um, in any genre. And then my favorite RPG, the one that I always mention, is Itris B. It's a Norwegian RPG from 2011. I can put it in the chat. Uh, Itris B is the um, it is the creme de la creme of extremely minimalist games. It has like three rules. You know, if, you, if things are not certain, you draw from a deck and they'll say like no and or yes, but. So like pure improv theater rules. But then there's also a second deck and that's the weird stuff deck. Um, it's a surrealist RPG set in the 1920s, again, surrealist city. And you, you draw from the weird deck, you know, when you, um, you usually once a session, but often you know when we when you need to kick kick the narrative in a pants and suddenly it'll say like oh your evil double appears and runs off or oh you know uh you you wake up hours later without without any memory where are you <laughs> i mean, I mean it, it basically uh you know we'll take any scene that's that's lagging and kick it in the pants and give it a different spin and turn it into something new and otherwise, the, the world building is rich enough that I can basically sit down with the players, open the book and say, which neighborhood of interest B do you want to explore? And then they pick a neighborhood and then I go to that neighborhood and I say, okay, what stuff do we want to develop? And then, we, then we're already co-creating, um, you know, using the book. So the book is, of course, the, the actual RPG is integral to it, but it's all still shared storytelling and without a lot of um, cluttered mechanics to get in the way. That's, that's my answer. I guess another pretty much last question is um, in relation to our final project in this class. I don't know if Professor Tremel's talked to you about it. We're working on a world building project. Cool. So I was curious with a lot of the indie RPGs that you've looked at and how they've all built different worlds, how would you go about just world building in general? So the, the, the main question is, what do the players um, 
contribute to the world is all right and and, and what are the ambiguities present um again if we, we take dark souls as our example um you know dark souls will will have will, will, will you know have have some some ugly creatures say you know alas the halo of destruction has fallen and dies and 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 you're supposed to know what that means right or or, or there are these mysterious descriptions or whatever and and of course the, the creators of dark souls don't know what it means and you don't i mean you don't know and 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 somewhere in that amb ambiguous space meaning still forms you still begin to project what that is um so your world building is always uh kind of a tension between how much do you want to nail everything down and how much do you want to open things up so for diamond 20 we thought okay i don't want to give any of the characters backstories because i think that the players could do that on the fly a lot better just my own personal preference that way they don't have to read two pages of backstory or something like that and they can just be like aha you you know back in the day we had a past and then you can develop that together right and then, and then you and the cool thing is you as players develop chemistry as you and your characters develop chemistry the 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 um but but then then you know as a very defined map because then like that map is going to in, inspire you to set your scenes somewhere rather than a talky no space which is the, the improv default right where you're like i don't know i'm in a room we're in a room I don't know, are we at a party? We're at a party, right? Uh, boring parties in rooms are the worst, the worst possible role-playing spaces. I hate them. And, 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 and they're the LARP default and they're often even the you know, large player uh, party. So again, think, think of films that you like, think of, think of books that you like and think of the landscapes, the, the, the ecologies, the, the, the things that make them magical to you and or and or inspiring to you and then build your world out of that material i mean it's why 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 in legend of zelda breath of the wild like every hill you you crest is mysteriously over a very beautiful landscape like that's by freaking design that is not a natural landscape game that is all a intricately sculpted playground uh you know masking as nature and and that that that's what you should have is world building where where it, there's just intention behind your decisions and and don't worry too much about realism all right thank I, you so much and with that i think we're at time so thank you so much evan um for sharing all of this with us i ask everybody this at the end of their talks but um is it okay for people to contact you yeah absolutely i'll put my my email in the i'll put put my my um this is my gmail in in the chat and uh and i like chatting i obviously i like to talk and i like to meet new people and uh you are all uh horrendously lucky to be have a, uh, able to have a course like this uh, you know i i i, I you know I, I still teach mostly video games because because i have too many rpg shy, shy people so having rpgs and improvisational media as the center of the course that then everybody is is uh you know, involved in, I mean, that's just, that's just fantastic. So, so this is special. You're all special and reach out if you have any further questions. Yeah. Let's give Evan a big round of applause. Thank you so much, Evan, for coming and sharing so much with everybody.